Prince Harry gets a new job, Piers Morgan slams Meghan, and Prince Albert criticizes their tell-all interview. These type of conversations should be held within uh, the intimate quarters of, of uh, the family. Kate is bringing her passion for the art to the pages of a new book to raise money for charities, as she remains a pillar of strength to William during his family drama, as he is named Sexiest Bald Man Alive. They decided to go through the Google search data and add names of bald men with the word sexy and Prince William came up 17.6 million times. So that puts it to bed, I guess. And British commentators Jonathan Sacerdoti tells us how the UK is viewing Harry and Meghan after their tell-all interview. But I don't think that Buckingham Palace ever set out to trash the reputations of Meghan and Harry. Um, I don't think that is the case. We've got that plus so much more in today's Royally Us. Hello and welcome to Royally Us. I'm Christina, that's Molly, the host of the Diva Behavior Podcast. Molly, welcome to another week of Royal News. Hello, Christina. I'm so ready for this week. We've got more interview talk. It's just always going to be there, I feel It doesn't like. stop. I mean, it's yeah. been almost a month and this is really what people can't stop talking about. And so we're going to break it down even further if that's even possible, but we're going to do it. But before we get to all that, we have to get to our Royal viewers kicking off with Barbie Priestley, who says, I always remember the worried look on Diana's face during that panorama interview. Of course, last week we were comparing um, Harry and Meghan's tell all interview to Diana's panorama interview. And yes, there was definitely a lot of worry on, uh, on her face. Yeah, it was, you could just tell. And I think people heard from her so infrequently in the lead up to that interview that it was probably even more shocking. Mm -hmm, totally. Next one goes, how do I delete this nonsense? That's their username. They weren't talking about our show. They said officially over this story, please can anyone else in pop culture do anything? I think we have to agree. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, definitely. I'm ready for something new to happen. hundred percent. <laughs> totally. And then Debbie says, you are assuming that Harry and Meg's version is true. They are spinning things to make the royal family look bad. They are angry that, that they didn't get their way and now they want payback. I mean, we've said this before, you know, this is the only version that we're hearing. So, you know, this is the only thing that we can really go, go off. So that's what we're analyzing and that's what we're talking about. And I don't think they want payback. I think they just want to set the record straight as they begin their new lives outside the royal family so that the things that happened while they were in the royal family don't continue to harm their reputation and business prospects. So I don't think it's really about payback or spinning things. I think it's just, this is what happened. Now let's stop talking. Right. About yeah. It. It's almost like they want a clean slate and kind of to move forward, but Definitely. I don't know if that's what exactly what they achieved, but <laughs> that's maybe yeah. what they wanted. All right, well, let's get to our Royal Roundup and we will kick it off with Prince Albert criticizing Harry and Meghan's interview. Take a look. It, it, it did bother me a little bit. I, I can understand where they're coming from in, in a certain way, but, but I think it, was, uh, it wasn't the appropriate uh, forum to, to uh, uh, be able to have these, these kind of discussions. I mean, you know, he does sympathize with Harry and Meghan, but he also says, you know, it probably wasn't the most appropriate forum to kind of lay it all out there. And, you know, this has been the great debate for, you know, the past month, whether or not people agree that they should have done this or they should have kept things private. But it seemed like the conversations that we're having in private weren't going anywhere. Right. And it makes sense that someone who's also part of a European royal family is more dedicated to protecting the institution than they are to protecting the individuals. But it is surprising to me that Prince Albert would be critical of this, given the fact that his mother, Grace Kelly, also had a hard time right. being in the royal family of Monaco. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I thought, I mean, if he's so upset why talk about it? Right. Why bring it up again? Why make yeah. it into another story? Make it you know? into another story. Yeah, totally. All right. Well, Harry is going to be very busy since he now has a new title, Chief Impact Officer at Silicon Valley startup Better Up Inc. So this was uh, a little bit of a surprising move. I mean, I don't think a lot of people saw this coming. Yeah, definitely. I, I don't think I've ever heard of the title Chief Impact Officer mm -hmm. before, but sounds exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, Harry will not be going into the office every day. It sounds like he's going to be sort of a brand ambassador for the company mm -hmm. and sort of expand its reach, get people to know a little bit more about it. Uh, so yeah, it sounds like a pretty good 
deal for yeah. both parties. Oh, definitely. I think now everybody knows what better up is. I don't think a lot of people did before that, but I mean, clearly just putting his name on this, uh, this job title, uh, increased, I'm sure the business tenfold. So I guess he's already earning that paycheck, which we don't know how much he, he has the, um, you know, they're not saying, so we don't know exactly what he's being compensated for, but I'm sure it's well worth his time. <laughs> so Duchess Kate is coming to your coffee table alongside Britain's National Portrait Gallery. She's announced a coffee table publication of last year's successful Hold Still exhibition. I love this. I think this is great. Yeah, so she last year asked people to take photos in lockdown of everyone getting used to the new normal. And now it's all being compiled into a coffee table book. And they released a really beautiful photo of her to go along with it, even though her own photography will not be appearing in the book. It's all other people's photos. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. And obviously, you know, we've talked about it before. Photography is something that she's super passionate about. So now everybody can can enjoy everybody else's photographs that were taken over this uh, this past year. And it's good for a good cause. Well, Kate and William visited their wedding venue at West Westminster Abbey recently, but it wasn't to renew their vows. This was actually to visit a vaccination center. Right. There's an, there's a vaccination center in like the most gorgeous church in the world. So nice. yeah, I'm definitely going to be trying to get my vaccine there when, when the time <laughs> comes, but it hasn't yet. But they also thanked the volunteers at the center for their hard work and commitment to the rollout. So definitely a great little visit. Definitely. Yes. Ours are happening at high school gyms. Theirs is happening at Westminster Abbey. <laughs> Very <Yeah>. nice. <laughs> All right. Well, Prince William, this is a funny story, story, was given the title this week of Sexiest Bald Man Alive. Molly, what do you think about this? <laughs> I can think of a couple other sexier bald men, actually, like Stanley Tucci, uh, he's the big front runner, but apparently this is based on science. Some researchers from the cosmetic surgery firm Longevita, uh, they decided to go through the Google search data and add names of bald men with the word sexy and Prince William came up 17.6 million times. So that puts it to bed, I guess. Amazing. I know The Rock uh, spoke out saying that they that he couldn't believe that Larry David didn't get it, even though The Rock is also a bald, a bald star. But yeah, I guess um, congratulations, Prince William. Another title that I'm sure you are very happy to have. <laughs> I know. I, I can't imagine what the conversation was like over breakfast when they found out this news. <laughs> right, totally. Um, well, Prince Charles and Duchess Camilla arrived in Greece for their first overseas trip since the most recent UK COVID lockdown. And it seems like, you know, uh, Charles has a profound tie to Greece, obviously, with uh, his father, Prince Philip. Right. This one did sting a little bit for those of us who are in the UK and not allowed to leave our neighborhoods. But uh, he made a really nice speech. He talked about his father, um, his father's father and his mother who lived in Athens and shielded a family of Jewish people during the Nazi occupation. So he really made a great speech all about his ties to Greece and everything. It was, it was nice. It almost made it worth it to watch someone else going on vacation <laughs> instead of the rest of us. Totally. Hopefully soon. Well, speaking of Charles, Jack Farthing has been cast as Prince Charles opposite Kristen Stewart in the upcoming film Spencer. And I definitely see a little bit of a resemblance between the two. A little bit, but yeah. he's no Josh O'Connor. And no. I think they're going to have to do some, some fancy fancy tricks with wigs and lighting a little bit, mm -hmm. but you know, totally brown haired white men. So. <laughs> right. But I feel like Kristen Stewart is kind of nailing these looks so far. I mean, they released another photo of her as Diana and I, I really think that she's going to pull it off. He's definitely, I think this is going to be such a good movie. I think I'm going to probably want to watch it seven times in a row. <laughs> it's going to be so good. I can't wait. All right. Well, now it is time to spill the royal tea. And we are hearing that Duchess Kate has been Prince William's pillar of strength since the fallout of Harry and Meghan's bombshell interview. You know, she's kind of holding it together and uh, holding down the fort while they kind of deal with the aftermath of this. Yes. So apparently she is a natural leader is what a source said, who has a magnificent ability to remain composed. So I wouldn't have known she was a nat natural leader. I didn't know that about her. Really interesting <laughs> quote. And she is just, yeah, they're leaning on each other for support. So. Yeah. But like most couples will do. So I'm glad that they're, they have each other and they're kind of going through this together. Well, Piers Morgan returned to slamming Meghan Markle in a lengthy newspaper article that detailed his versions of events in the aftermath of their interview. 
I mean, Piers has had this one-sided feud with Meghan for quite some time. And obviously, as we know, he left Good Morning Britain after he stormed off the set after he was questioned. <laughs> So not only did he voluntarily leave his job, but he's now writing about it in one of the biggest selling newspapers in the UK, the Mail on Sunday, about how like the woke crowd is silencing him. I just want to know when the silencing is happening because yeah. I feel like he's been trying to get canceled for years and for it's just years. not happening. It's just not happening. People are but always giving him a forum to speak his mind, I guess. It's just... Yeah. I mean, it's kind of crazy that he still holds on to such a grudge against Megan after all this time. Like, just let it go. And it's he can dish it, but he doesn't seem like he can take it. Yeah, and he repeated in this piece several times that he does not believe what Megan said. And it's just like, and that, and he says that he quit because he didn't want to apologize. So, I mean, good on him for not giving a false apology, right. but also why is it your place to doubt someone's mental health struggle? Exactly. I just don't, it's, he clearly didn't get the memo yet. So definitely didn't. Well, someone else that doesn't believe everything Megan is saying is Duchess Kate's uncle, Gary Goldsmith, who said, Kate doesn't have a mean bone in her body. Now this is referencing uh, Megan's story where she said that Kate made her cry over the flower girl dresses. I, mean, I don't, I don't think you have to be mean to make right. someone cry during wedding planning. Like it's stressful. It's just mm -hmm. stressful. Everyone probably cries at least once while planning their wedding. So I just, I don't think Kate's mean. And Megan even said she's a good person. So I don't think this even needs to really be a thing. M more of a story. Yeah. She said she apologized. They moved on from it. And, you know, it seemed like Megan just wanted to set the record straight because the palace never did. And that was, I think, the goal and what she wanted to accomplish when she told that story. But people got a lot of opinions. All right. Well, speaking of opinions, it is time to break down the royal rules. And to help us do that is British commentator Jonathan Sacerdoti. Take a look. So how is the UK viewing Harry and Meghan now that some time has passed from the interview? It's interesting because I think it would be easy to say that this was a US-UK split of opinion and that people here in the United Kingdom were more team royal and people in the States were more team Meghan and Harry. Um, but I don't think that's the case. Some of the press and indeed popular conversation around here has been of that nature. Indeed, they've been dubbed Gingham Whinge by some people, just to give you an impression of how much people took this to heart. But younger Britons were more likely to sympathise with this couple and the things that they were saying. Again, I think that's very, very key to understanding this problem, this whole incident. I think that they made a very calculated decision in giving that interview very public thing to do with some very private issues from a couple who said they wanted to step out of the limelight and regain their privacy. They've done anything but that. There's no question in anyone's mind that giving a two hour interview is not the act of somebody who wishes to regain their privacy and who wishes to deal with private things in private. Mm -hmm. But by getting the sympathies of some younger Britons and by getting the sympathies more internationally of those who perhaps look more fondly on celebrities than on archaic royalty and royal families, they've hit their target because they have some British younger people who are their target market on their side and many people in America where they're now living and trying to work on their side. So I think that opinions are split, but largely speaking here in the UK, people are much more cynical and skeptical about what they said. Mm -hmm. I, so, I mean, what do you think then was their overall purpose or goal for doing this interview? Was it to, you know, repair the relationships that they have with their family or was it for their own fame and money gain, in your opinion? I mean, for real, can anyone think that the aim of that interview was to repair the relationships with their family? I mean, put aside that they're a royal family. If I went and said that my family were racists and cut me off from money and also were unsympathetic when I was suicidal, I don't think you would for one minute think I was aiming to repair any broken relationships. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, if after that there was a phone call and I then went to Gail King and said, hey, I just had a chat with the next king of Britain and the one after him, and my, they're my father and brother, and they were still no use and we didn't make any progress. No, of course, it's not their aim to repair any broken relationships. And I think it's probably fair to say that many people look at Meghan Markle's relationships with all of her other family and see broken relationships all around her. So why is it that 
when Meghan and Harry speak about what happened, it's considered a bid for fame and money, but when the palace retaliates, it's considered reputational defense. Don't you think maybe they could both be reputational defense? I think to a certain degree, there is an element of both having to defend their reputations, but I don't think that Buckingham Palace ever set out to trash the reputations of Meghan and Harry. Um, I don't think that is the case. It is certainly true that they had some complaints in that interview that they felt that they weren't given the same level of attention as, say, uh, his brother, uh, who would one day be the king of Great Britain, and uh, his wife, so that is William and Kate. And that seemed to be their main complaint in terms of the press coverage, uh, which was that they would constantly see press stories about themselves they said that weren't true and the palace wouldn't correct them. Now that is an interesting feature of how tough life must be in the royal family, especially in their position. Uh, Harry is what they jokingly call to as the spare to William being the heir. And the purpose of, of the family relationships in the royal family is to perpetuate a line of succession. So that is Queen Elizabeth II, then it will be Prince Charles, and then it will be Prince William. Harry is number six on the list. So I think it is true that it clearly hurt them mm -hmm. that they were not as important reputationally within the royal family as the future king and his wife. We're talking about two monarchs down the line. So if the royal family did protect the reputations of Kate and William at the expense of the relationships of Meghan and Harry, it can be no surprise to anyone because the reputation that's being protected by the royal family is of the entire monarchy and ultimately the line of monarchs that will come to be in charge of the royal family. So that's why perhaps they weren't constantly defended by the operations within the royal family press office. And that may have hurt them, especially as people who do seem very concerned with their own personal reputation and building a brand around their own tight-knit two-person, three-person, soon-to-be four-person family, rather than the royal family. All right, well, moving on to our Royal History Moment of the Week. And while the Queen's 95th birthday is on April 21st, we are the ones that are getting a lot of presents. The Royal Collection Trust has released a new range of China ware and decorations for royal fans to collect. I'm all about the corgi ornament. <laughs> it's so cute. I love the tea sets and the tea mugs. My mom's birthday is coming up, so I may or may not have bought her one because she is the queen of my life. So it's just great. Everyone should go check all this stuff out. It's really nice, really sweet. It's on the Royal Collection Trust website. Yeah, it's awesome. I can't believe 95 in just a couple of weeks. So good for her. That is amazing. All right. Well, before we wrap up, we have to check in on the royal kids and Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip recently welcomed their 10th great grandchild. Zara Tindell and her husband, Mike, welcomed their third child, a baby boy. But it definitely wasn't an easy delivery. This is wild. Yeah. So apparently Zara gave birth in their bathroom on the floor. And Mike Tindall shared the story. He said he got a mat, ran to the bathroom, and the baby came out. So, I mean, God bless. I love it. And then he said, you know, we had enough time for skin to skin and then put on a little golf, which is something my husband would probably say as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations, another, another baby to the family. So they definitely 10 great grandchildren. That's amazing. Yeah. Really a nice story. Definitely. Well, Molly, thank you so much for breaking down all things Royals as always. Thank you, Christina. All right. Make sure to check out Royally Us every Wednesday on Us Weekly's YouTube channel. Keep commenting, keep subscribing, and Molly and I will see you next week.